we have all heard the phrase, patience is a virtue, right? You all saw this in the bulletin sermon, nothing fancy, it's just called patience. And you thought, oh boy, do I have the patience for this, right? Well, patience is a virtue. We, we've heard it. It's a, it's a common phrase. It's, it's said a lot. It's often used, but uh, I would say maybe seldom completely understood and, and, and said at times when it's not uh, necessarily thoroughly meant, you know, at different times we say it, and we may not exactly know precisely what we're saying. Now, we think we know what patience means, and you, you probably do. It's a common word, but it does have a kind of a big definition, not that it's necessarily long, but it, it's big. I mean, patience is a, a rather heavy thing to really and truly have, not just to kind of sort of halfway exercise it at different times when you're thinking of it, but to really be patient and to have patience as a virtue that could be attributed consistently to you. Patience is a, it's a big thing. Now, it's not just sitting around and waiting for something to happen or sitting around and, and hoping something doesn't happen or, or whatever the case may be. It's not just sitting around. It, it's this enduring thing. It's got to do with how we handle situations, how we manage things. It, it's got a lot to do with our attitude toward things that are happening or, or not happening in our lives. It, it's, it's the response. Uh, I'll give you an example. Two different people could, have, uh, could be facing the same kind of concern and it could look totally different just because of their attitude, because of their patience or lack thereof, right? For example, the example I'll give you, uh, let's say it, it's in a Christian setting and you are someone who is waiting for the fruits of your labors, right? You're waiting for fruit to be produced from the good works that you've been doing recently. You're waiting on that. Now, one person, as they wait, could stick to the plan, could stay on course, could continue serving the Lord and others, keep doing good things. The other could sit there, wait for a while, and then kind of just mentally check out, right? Assume that nothing good can happen. Vow to never try that particular thing again because it didn't work. I waited a week and I saw nothing, or I even waited a month and saw nothing, or whatever it may be, and then just, just give up. Just say, I'm, I've been discouraged by the entire ordeal, and I won't put myself through that again. They're both facing the same concern, right? But they're mentally, emotionally, even physically processing them in totally different ways. One is obviously practicing patience. One is obviously not practicing patience. And when we say patience is a virtue, do we know what a virtue is? I mean, do we really understand what a virtue is? I wonder if when we say that, if we realize that a virtue is a behavior showing or demonstrating high moral standards. That's what a virtue is. A, a virtue is behavior that shows high moral standards. So when we say patience is a virtue, we're saying that patience is actually an issue of morality. My, my point in pointing that out to you is this. It's not just an important thing or a, a, a good thing. It's right. It's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. It's what we've been called to do, right? The Bible teaches us that we should be patient. We, members of the Lord's church, are called, commanded to be patient. And if every member of the Lord's church were more patient, not just in their interactions with one another, because that's when we sometimes uh, have trouble keeping our patience is when we're dealing with people. But we need patience there, but not just in our interactions with one another in the church and even outsiders as well, but in that enduring way where we don't throw up our hands and give up so easily, where we don't give in. What a difference that would make if individually we committed to that to this kind of patience, what a difference that would make in the Lord's church, in, in, in the, the health of our church, in the health of any church where any Christian would practice patience like this, what a difference it would make in the collective effectiveness uh, of our efforts to change the world for Christ. I mean, that would make a massive difference. I mean, could you imagine if everything the church started that was a good idea, you know, we didn't give up on? Because there's some things that, sure, Maybe it wasn't a good idea. Maybe we determined that it wasn't a good idea. Sure, I'm not saying we don't ever quit anything. We don't ever say, you know what, we shouldn't do this forever. But things that were like, no, this is the right thing to do. But I'm just not feeling fulfilled by it. I'm just not satisfied by it. The church doesn't act like they want to do it. You know, if it's right, don't give up on it. Keep going. What if we had that kind of patience? 
We're, of course, continuing our series this morning. Uh, we've got this week and next week, uh, Lord willing, that's the plan anyway, of this family meeting series that we've been in for several weeks now, where we're discussing how we can all become better individual members of the Lord's church. Better individual members of the Lord's church so that the church as a whole can become more healthy, spiritually healthy. And by healthy, I mean appears more like the body that Christ designed, that God designed for his church so that we would be able to make that difference for Christ. We need healthy churches to, to create a change in the world, a change for Christ, a change where people turn to Christ. And that starts, where do we say? With us. That starts with each one of us taking these meetings and saying, yes, I will do that. I will commit to doing that. So today's family meeting is all about patience, obviously. This morning, I want us to look at James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. So uh, if you want to get out those Bibles and turn to the book of James, James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. Of course, it'll be up here on the screen in just a moment. And as we look at these verses, we're going to see that, that James instructs the church to be patient. He, he says, you need to be patient. Be patient, brethren, right? And from this text, we're going to see that we need patience because there are some circumstances that seem out of our control. We're going to see that we need patience because sometimes even our brothers and sisters in Christ might frustrate us, might do things that frustrate us. We need patience because we've been commanded to interact in a specific way with those outside of the church. And we need patience because sometimes the problems that we face just don't make sense to us. We need patience through that. A certain kind of patience. A biblical patience. The patience that James is talking about here, okay? So let's take a look at the text together and then we'll jump right into these uh, simple lessons, okay? James chapter 5, starting verse 7. The Bible says, Therefore be patient until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Now, before we jump directly into these lessons here on patience. We need to make sure that we understand the patience that James is talking about. In the original Greek language that he wrote this in, the, the word that he used, the word that James uses as he writes about patience, it's a word that means long-suffering, uh, long-tempered, um, Long of spirit, right? Long of spirit means that you don't get discouraged in such a way that you give up easily or quickly. You hang in there for a long time. And that's exactly, um, there, there's, there's multiple words that can, can be translated and are translated in your New Testament as patience or patient or be patient and all that. And, and they're all very similar, honestly, when we, when we try to apply it in, from Scripture. They're all going to work out pretty similar, but I want you to understand that this one means hanging in there for the long haul. This one means not giving up so easily. It's, as I said before, not just simply the idea of being willing to sit around and wait. Instead, it's the idea of being unwilling to give up, unwilling to give in. That's the kind of patience that James is talking about here. That's the kind of wording that he uses. Can you imagine the shot in the arm that this would give uh, our church, any church, if each individual member of the Lord's church would commit to working on this kind of patience? That'd be a big deal, right? All right, so starting there in verse 7, James gives us this important example that reminds us that we need to be patient when circumstances seem uncontrollable. Show of hands. Who's ever felt like circumstances were uncontrollable? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I kind of thought so. And my hand was not up as an example of how to raise your hand. My hand was up because I too have experienced circumstances that seemed uncontrollable. Verse 7, James said, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. So uh, it's a command to be patient for how long? It's a lifetime of, of patience, right? Until the coming of the Lord, till he returns, okay? Then James says, he gives this example. He says, the farmer, he waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it 
until it gets the early and late rains. Farmers do a lot of work, right? They do a lot of work, and a lot of it is very hard work. It's very difficult work. They get up early, they work long hours, and they do their best to do everything right from their end because that's all they can control, right, it is what they can do to, to set everything up the right way for the best opportunity for things to work out right. But can, can they make the crops grow physically? Do they make those crops grow? No. I mean, do they split the seed? Do, does, do they cause the first shoot to come up and then for the harvest to mature? Do they cause that? And they can do some things to help that. But, but again, no, they, they don't do that. They don't insert the color or the nutrients or the flavor uh, of the corn or anything else, right? They, they can't control when it rains. They can't keep away the rains. I mean, the, a lot of the rains they don't want to keep away, right? But there's times where it's like, oh, this is a little too much. Or there's times where there's storms that have hard blowing winds that we've seen even around here just blew crops completely over, right? They don't have the control to keep that stuff away or to bring the stuff in that they want, the, the rains at the right time and things like that. A farmer does all he can and he tries tries to do everything right, but ultimately the biggest part of the whole process, the biggest part of the whole process is in God's hands. We, we know that. God causes the growth. God sends the rains. God created the plant and the seed. It, he's the biggest part of the process. He takes care of the biggest part of the process because it's his process, right? We're just kind of participating in it. As a, as a farmer, we just participate in it. As we raise a garden, we just participate. But he is the one who, it's his process, and he takes care of the biggest part of it. We need the patience of the farmer. That's what James said, right? He, he said, take the example. Do what the farmer does is what he's telling us. We need the patience of the farmer. And, and I know um, some of you sitting in this room who have done some farming, you're thinking, I don't know if I'd call myself patient, you know? And yes, sometimes farming, sometimes gardening, we don't feel patient, but I'm telling you, those of you who garden, those of you who patient, uh, those of you who patient, those of you who farm, you, you're more patient than the church. In the way that James is talking, you're more patient than the church. At least you know that you can't put a seed in the ground and then later that day be like, well, honey, we may have to figure out something different for supper because the corn's not growing, you know? You know not to do that. You know it's not going to be by the end of the week or even by the end of the month, right? Most people, you know, you're thinking, I, order something online and, and how are you feeling? What's your attitude if it hasn't arrived in a month? <laughs> you're like, let's not even talk about that, Jake. You know, I, I, I pay for my prime membership so that it comes in two dates, right? Right, it, it, it makes us impatient, right? But the farmers, the gardeners, they know it's not gonna work like that and they're not discouraged and downtrodden because they have patience. They, they understand the process. They trust the process. They've seen this happen time and time again, right? They trust that the soil they prepared, the seed they planted will in time produce that harvest. They don't know exactly how tall the corn is gonna grow, they don't know the exact output of the soybeans that they planted, but for several, several months, they ultimately believe that the harvest is coming. They believe it. And so they don't poke around in the dirt after a week. And after just a little bit longer, they don't get discouraged because the corn uh, is taking a little longer to grow. It's still, it's, it's short right now. And, you know, they, they don't sell off the field and say, you know, forget it. They don't get discouraged after a couple months, you know, and say, well, this stuff is not as tall or as green or as big as I thought it would be and sell all the equipment, the tractors and all the implements and everything and just say, I'm never farming again. They don't do that. They're patient, at least in the way that James is talking about. They're patient. James says in verse 8, we need to strengthen our hearts. He says, like the farmer, right? The farmer who learns to trust the process. He said, you too. James said, you too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, right? When he says you too, he's comparing you to the farmer. He says, be like the farmer, you too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Like the farmer, we make inputs, right? We're not just a slave to what happens, right? We make inputs, we prepare soil, we sow seed, and we can tend the fields, and we should. But a lot of life often feels like it's out of control. You all have experienced it, I know, because every one of you raised your hands, or at least most of you raised your hands, and the reason that a lot of life feels, a lot of our lives feel like they're out of control or a lot of the, the areas of life at times can feel that way is because they are. <laughs> there is a lot that is outside of our control. I hope that's not 
bad news uh, because uh, I want to tell you why it's good news. The good news is because you know whose control that is, un is in? Who does have control of that? God does, right? The areas that we can't control, God does control. He has given us areas that he expects us to control, expects us to manage, to steward well, but then everything else is left to him, what he's going to do about it, how he's going to handle it. All that other stuff is in God's control, and we know he's working things out, right? Romans 8, 28, as soon as I said working things out, those words as a Christian made you go, you were, maybe you didn't know the book, chapter, and verse. Several of you did. <laughs> but you immediately thought, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Do you know what believing that looks like? Starts with P, ends with patience. Let's hear it. All God's people said? Patience. patience. That's what believing that looks like in real life. It looks like the patience that James is talking about. It looks like the farmer who doesn't go, golly, I put the dirt on top. Where's the crop? Right? It's, no, 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 no. I did what I can do. I'll continue to do what I can do. And I'm just waiting on God. Not getting discouraged. Not giving up. Just, just waiting on God. And like James said, I want to remind you, the Lord is near. Sooner or later, he's going to work things out. Sooner or later, he's going to bring about the harvest. What a shame it would be to get discouraged, to lack patience, and to give up too soon. And ultimately, not in this life, well, it will happen in this life, but it will be the beginning of eternal life for us. Sooner or later, the Lord is coming back for his church, for those who stayed faithful to him to the end. And oh boy, what a shame it would be to lack patience and to give up too soon. There are a lot of circumstances that seem uncontrollable God's handling that. Be like the patient farmer. James introduces a second lesson starting at verse 9. And that lesson is that we need to be patient when the saints seem less than lovable. All right? We need to be patient when, patient when the saints seem less than lovable. Uh, listen again to what James said in verse 9. He says, do not complain. Do not complain, brethren, against one another. So that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing, I like how he says it, right at the door. He's right there. Now, why is the lesson to be patient when the saints seem less than lovable? Well, James is talking about patience and endurance, right? Staying faithful to the very end. We, we can see that very uh, right on the surface, right? And he uses the phrase one another, referring back to brethren that he just mentioned, but even just addressing the church and saying one another, we know that's uh, not even code for, but that is addressing Christians, right? One another refers to Christians, others who have been set apart for God, right? The family of God, the church, saints by calling. We've talked about that in this series. And when do you complain against your church family? When you complain against the saints, when you don't think they're behaving as they should, right? When, when, when you're finding them hard to love, when they appear to you as less than lovable. And so if James says, do not complain against one another, obviously the time we do that is when they're seeming hard to deal with. That person is seeming hard for me to love. I'm having a hard time, you know, having a warm, fuzzy feeling about them right now. That's when that happens. James says we need to be patient toward our church family. We need to not complain against them. And he says, so that, and this is important, he says, so that you will not be judged. And you remember, did you, did you catch the, the quick reference? Did you catch the, ki the quick reading in that last verse about how James said the Lord is near? Right, he said that before when he said we need to strengthen our hearts. He said the Lord is near. Well, now in this next verse, he, he says it again. He reminds us of that fact again. But in this context now, right? He says, so that you will not be judged. And then he says, behold, the judge, capital J, the judge is standing right at the door. So if you were thinking that you can complain against your brother and not be judged, James says, nope, <laughs> nope. He's standing right at the door. That's the way he says it. He doesn't just say, he's standing at the door. He says he is standing right at the door. You're right here complaining against your brother, you know, and, and Jesus, you need to picture him going, you know I can hear you, right? 
Like, I can see what you're doing. I can hear what you're doing. I, I am all-knowing and all-powerful. I, I am all that, right? He's standing right at the door. He sees us. He hears us. He knows us. And he is the judge. He's the one that's going to judge us. And I know, and so I got to warn myself and all of us, I think it's wise, that if we're not careful, we'll start using that dangerous phrase, yeah, but, right? It's two words, but it's always said together, yeah, but. Yeah, but they weren't acting like a Christian. Yeah, but they didn't encourage me like I wanted them to, right? Yeah, but they don't seem like they're even trying. Yeah, but they just aren't getting it. Yeah, but they don't even seem into it. Yeah, but their family and my family have never got along. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And, and I say to, again, to myself and to all of us who have done that, yeah, but look what we've done. Every single one of us has made ourselves hard to love. Right? We have actually made ourselves impossible to love. We have separated ourselves from God by our transgressions, right? Isaiah tells us that, that our, our iniquities, our transgressions create a separation between us and God. Yeah, but look what we've done, Christians. Look how we've made ourselves hard to love. Jesus had to do the hardest thing that's ever been done to demonstrate God's love for us. And now, Christian, I know you're thinking of Romans chapter 5, verse 8, right? Immediately, you're thinking, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Be patient. Oh, please, be patient with your fellow saints. Guys, they may never get it. And you know what? It may not be something that sends them to hell. And so what a shame if you got hung up on it and couldn't be patient with them about it. Be patient with your fellow saints when they seem less than lovable, meaning don't complain against them like James says, because God was patient with you when you seemed less than lovable. The third lesson that James's words bring to mind is that we need to be patient when people seem unchangeable. <laughs> kind of goes a little bit along with the last lesson here. But look at what James wrote in verse 10. I, I believe it has, this lesson has a little more to do with uh, the outsiders that we're dealing with, not the insiders, not the church family. That's the, the, the marked difference here, but there's a little more to it. Look at what James wrote in verse 10. He says, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. So we got to think about this one a little bit because he doesn't expound a whole lot on it. He just says, take the prophets. So let's not make this a, a, a tricky situation or complicated. Uh, I want to ask you a question and it's not a trick question. What did the prophets do? It's in the name. What did prophets do? Say it louder. Prophesied, right? Yeah, that's what they did. They were prophesying. And when you prophesy, you speak God's truth, God's word to others. And the point of doing that is so that they would be informed and act on that, right? You're being warned about God's wrath. Turn away from what you're doing that's bringing the wrath upon you, right? That, that's simple. That's what the prophets did. That's what prophets do. They speak God's truth to others. And the point is so that others would hear it, be informed, and make a smart decision. Respond appropriately uh, the right way to that, right? Now, many prophets prophesied and people didn't listen. People didn't do the right thing. People didn't respond appropriately. They responded inappropriately. You might be thinking about Noah right now. That's who I thought of immediately, right? Noah prophesied. Noah spoke uh, in the name of the Lord, as James says, trying to save people, right? He was trying to save people by telling them that what God had said, they didn't listen. They didn't listen to, to Noah's prophesying. James's words applied to the church in the first century. When he says consider the prophets, he, that applies to the church in the first century just as much as it applies to the church now, right? James says, as an example, brethren, church, right, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We have the written word of the Lord to share with the whole world. We can know that we are speaking in the name of the Lord. And typically, our number one fear, it's not knowing what to say, right? Our, our number one fear in sharing his word is not knowing what to say. Well, we can take care of that, right? We can study up, we can learn what to say. Our second fear, and this is the one that, that I want to address and, and talk about, 
is rejection. Personal and also just the, 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 uh, the rejection of that truth that we're sharing, right? We're afraid that we won't change people's minds. That they'll have an answer for it, for why they don't want to believe it, why they won't believe it. We fear that people won't believe the gospel message. But what did the prophets do? Take the example, brethren, of the prophets. What did the prophets do? Having no idea if people's minds would be changed, they prophesied. They opened their mouths. They spoke in the name of the Lord. That means they spoke by and with his authority. Church we need to take the example of the prophets. We have every right to preach the gospel. We have the right. We have the permission to be the ones who are sharing the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure. He's talking about the light of the gospel in its context. We're not going to read all that. He's talking about the light of the gospel. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We have every right to preach this message. I'm trying to encourage you. We also have every reason. There's a purpose. There's a reason to preach this gospel. Romans 1.16, right? We know Paul says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Church, the gospel does save. Even if people don't listen a lot of the time, even if we take the example of the prophets, we know what the example of the prophets was, what they did, but we also know what their reaction was. But we also know what happened to those who listened. We know that it was good, that it did work out for the best to those who would hear the message, believe the message, and respond appropriately. The gospel does save, so we have every reason to preach it, to proclaim it. But we also have every responsibility to preach the gospel. We have every responsibility because in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus told his disciples that all authority had been given to him. Where? In heaven and on earth. All authority. And that's the man who in verse 19 told his disciples, go therefore. Because I have all this authority and I'm telling you, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. So it is our responsibility. We have the right, we have the reason, and we have the responsibility to proclaim, to go and preach the gospel. Be patient when people seem unchangeable. Faith still comes by hearing the word of Christ. The gospel is still God's power to save. Don't give up. Like the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, be patient and keep proclaiming his truth, his gospel. Now the fourth and final lesson that James's words bring to mind here is that we need to be patient when problems are unexplainable. And this may be the one that you're waiting for because this is the one that is so difficult. They're all difficult. Don't get me wrong. But this is the one when, when pain comes, when difficulty comes, when uh, setbacks come. This is the one. Be patient when problems are unexplainable. In verse 11, verse 11, James wrote, We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job. Whew. <laughs> I don't like James bringing this up. Because he's already told me to take the example of the farmer. Right? He's told me to strengthen my heart like him. He's told me to take the example of the prophets and now he's bringing up Job and that makes me uncomfortable. You've heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. Now that's good. That the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. So it turned out okay. That there was a lot that was gone through before it turned out okay. There's a lot of patience that had to be practiced in the interim between those moments, right? We don't have to even go very deep into Job's story to understand the example of Job. James said, you've heard about it. James says, you know about the endurance of Job. We know the Lord allowed, and this makes us uncomfortable, but, but we know it's the truth. The Lord allowed Satan to test Job's faith, right? Job lost a lot. Job endured a lot. Job experienced suffering. Job wanted things to be different. Right? Job is not just this superhuman who was like, you know, poof, poof, just taking the bullets like, yeah, it doesn't bother me any. He wanted it to be different. He did not enjoy what he went through. He, he didn't even enjoy it in the sense of like, you know, boy, this is very fulfilling and satisfying to have my faith tested and see that I can stand up to all the, the flaming arrows of the devil. No, he didn't want it to be this way. He didn't like it at all. And for the longest part of what we read about Job's story in the Bible, Job didn't understand why this was happening. That's the, the majority of the book. Why is this happening? Right? 
Job didn't understand the problems he was facing. He had problems that he didn't understand. His friends and his wife bombarded him with bad counsel. We know about that. He had questions for God. We know about that. The pain and the frustration was real. But while it was a little messy and maybe we would see it as a little imperfect, he didn't give up on God. He didn't walk away from God. When Job asked God questions, God answered those questions. In Job chapter 38, verses 4 and 5, <laughs> I say God answered Job, maybe not quite like you were hoping. If you're not familiar with how he responded, it may not be what you were thinking. He didn't reveal to him. He didn't pull the curtain back and say, Job, I'm going to give you the ability to understand everything that's going on uh, in your universe and beyond. He didn't do that. Job couldn't have understood every piece of the puzzle. Here's how God answered Job. He said, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have the understanding. Who said its measurements? Since you know. Did you know God is sarcastic sometimes? <laughs> you can't read that and tell me God isn't sarcastic. Anyway, later on, we go down to verse 8. God says, because he just keeps going with this, all the way down to verse 8 and beyond verse 8. But in verse 8, God says, Or who enclosed the sea? With the doors, when bursting forth, it went out from the womb. When I made a cloud, its garment, and thick darkness, its swaddling band. And I placed boundaries on it, and set a bolt and doors. And I said, thus far shall you come, but no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. And God's answer continues. On and on and on like this, pointing out all these powerful, mighty things that God knows and does that Job could never have done or fully understood. It goes on for the rest of this chapter and the next chapter and the next chapter and the next chapter all the way through to the end of chapter 41. And then when we come to chapter 42, Job's like, are you done? I get it. <laughs> In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 42, it says, Job answered the Lord. And he said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You see, Job understood that regardless of what's going on, it's not that, 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 that God was losing control of things. It's not that, that, that God was allowing things that he didn't want to allow. He knew that whatever was going on, however unexplainable it was, God was in control of everything. He may not have been making evil things happen to Job, but God was allowing it for a reason of some kind. And golly, what could it be? Anybody got a Bible in their hands right now? I mean, my goodness, what, what on earth could be the reason that Job went through all this and it was recorded for us and everything else? Boy, what a coincidence. How, how lucky we were that, that somebody wrote this down. And that's my pea brain trying to figure it out. There's far more, far more that, that has to do with Job's life uh, directly with his life, not just ours and an example for us. But what an example. So be patient when you don't understand problems. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't walk away. Don't curse God. He knows more than we know. He's done more than we can ever do. And, and so we're going to face a lot in this life that from our perspective, a lot of problems that from our perspective are unexplainable. And we're called to trust God. And we're called to be the kind of patient that James is talking about here. God knows why things happen. He knows why he allows certain things to transpire and why he intervenes in other things to prevent other things from happening. So when we don't understand why the illness hit our family, be patient. When we don't understand why the tragic accident was allowed to happen, we got to be patient. When we can't make sense of all the stuff, all the things that seem to be happening, all, all, the, all the bad things that seem to be happening to what appear to be good people, we've got to be patient. We've got to be the kind of church member who is patient. We got to be a church member who demonstrates patience toward God, right? It's not just patience with one another, it's patience towards God. Someone that our church family and outsiders can, can look at, can see our example and see that we trust God. Like I don't have to worry if, if uh, just, I'm not going to name a name because I don't want to, you know, put anybody on a pedestal or make anybody feel uh, inadequate or super special or anything else. But, but say we just say a name in the church. And we just know, like, like, I'm not worried that that person's going to give up. 
I'm not concerned that if they get hit with X, Y, or Z, they're just going to give in. That that would destroy them. Right? We just know that they just they trust God. There's nothing in this life that's going to throw them off the course. Imagine if you were that person. Imagine if we had a church full of people like that. That, that, that we knew no matter what life threw at them, regardless of whether we could explain it or even try to understand it at all, we knew that person wouldn't give up on God. Dream with me for a moment. Can you imagine the witness? Can you imagine the witness of even just one church in the whole world that was full of individuals like this? That was full of individuals that could not be separated from God by problems in this life. These things that happen to our bodies, these things that happen to our minds, these things that affect our emotions and our spirit. I imagine if there was one church in the whole world that was just full of people who wouldn't give up on God because of things that happened to them or their family or, or people they loved or even just knew. Can you imagine the encouragement that would have uh, for your brothers and sisters in Christ if they saw you that way? Can you imagine the encouragement that, that you would get from having a family around you, a church family around you that was like that, that behaved in that way? And can you imagine the attractive force that this would have on the world outside of Christ? My goodness, we'd open our mouth and they'd believe us. <laughs> we'd open our mouth and what could they argue with? They'd, they'd see the proof because we'd show them the pudding <laughs> day in and day out, right? And so I think I'll just close with James's words that he shared with us there in verse 7. For all these things considered, <laughs> therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord.